Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Just a, a, a slight correction. So I worked at UA University for a period of time before oh. moving to the British University in Dubai in 2019. Oh. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> um, yes, so well, thank you all for having me here today. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. A wonderful conference and, and great initiative that we have going on. Um, so I work as an assistant professor in the Department of Education at the British University in Dubai. And I also serve as director of the Center for Research in Digital Education. Um, we are the only center of our kind in the MENA region. Um, so we specialize in research specifically related to digital education. Um, we also design courses uh, for teaching uh, digital education. So we've created a master's degree and a PhD program in edtech. Um, we organize events regularly, webinars, seminars and things, teacher training, etc., cetera, um, related to edtech. We're also experts in digital inclusion. So in the years 2020 and 2021, we actually won international awards for our support of students with special educational needs in a digital context. Um, and we're also actively involved in creating and designing online programs. So we work with the Abdul al Ghurir Foundation project, if you've heard of that, which is essentially nine universities in the UAE creating the very first completely 100% online degree courses in the region, um, as well as working with Coursera for designing courses with them as well. Um, we have a number of uh, partnerships. We work closely with Lancaster University in the UK. They have a Centre for Technology Enhanced Learning. Um, last academic year, we published a journal with them. Um, we work with Pearson Professional to provide teacher training in the region, uh, not only in the UAE, but also Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. Um, we're institutional members uh, uh, of Blackboard, so that's the, in, in, you know, the learning management system we use at our university, as well as being partners with Coursera as well. Okay, so that's enough about the, uh, the research center. Uh, essentially, um, with our position, we have a good network with schools and universities in the region for doing research pertaining to digital education. And one of the things we really wanted to know about was how people are coping with hybrid learning, particularly during the pandemic. Now, we noticed during this period that there's lots of terminology coming out which are confusing people, online learning, blended learning, hybrid learning. Uh, there was a great article published back in 2019 which defined these terms quite clearly. Um, and so I'm going to try to visualize that for you uh, with, with some pictures. So let, let's imagine we have a, a middle school in Dubai, okay, we'll call it Dubai Middle School, and we have Mrs. Johnson, she's a mathematics teacher, and she has three students, Ahmed, Michael, and Sarah. Okay? Now in a purely online context, Mrs. Johnson would be at home, teaching remotely, and all three students would be in their homes studying remotely, okay? That's what we mean by online learning. I think during the pandemic, all of us were forced to do that for a period of time. When we talk about blended learning, that means for a percentage of time, let's pretend we have a 12-week semester. Um, maybe for six weeks, Mrs. Johnson would be in class, and so would the students. They would all be there together in class. And for the other half of the semester, the remaining six weeks, they would all be online. So Mr. Johnson's at home and the students are in their homes, okay? So blended learning is when we're combining between face-to-face -face teaching on campus and completely online learning, okay? When we talk about hybrid, it's slightly different. So in this case, poor Mr. Johnson, she goes to campus every day. She's always in the classroom. Some of the students are in the classroom with her, but some of the students are actually at home. Now what's happened here is maybe this student is COVID positive, so can't join the class or maybe with close contacts or has to remain at home. But there should be facilities in the classroom which allow the student to act as if they're there virtually, right? So they can see the teacher, they can engage with the students, okay? So online, everyone's at home, blended. Sometimes we're in class together, all of us. Sometimes we're on online, all of us. Hybrid means the teacher is on campus every day, but she's not sure who's going to turn up to class, right? So we ask a simple question. To what extent is this actually working, yeah. this hybrid learning model? And we wanted to know the perspectives of parents, students, teachers, and educational leaders. By leaders here, we mean uh, school principals, vice principals, you know, in universities, deans, right? We weren't able to get any vice chancellors on board or provosts, unfortunately. Um, but that was our, our question. So it's a purely qualitative research project. Okay. We, we simply held semi-constructed interviews. Uh, myself and two of my PhD students worked on this. 
Um, we contacted our network of, of schools and universities and were able to get 10 institutions to take part. So we had seven high schools and three universities. Um, in terms of parents, we've got parents from the K-12 sector, so parents who are in the high schools, but not at university level. Uh, we have a, a, a very strict um, research ethics committee at my university, so I wasn't allowed to collect any data from uh, children under the age of 18, so we couldn't get data from the K-12 sector from the high schools, unfortunately, from the students there. But we were, were able to get students at the university who are 18 and above, because they're adults, essentially. Um, in the schools, we had 31 teachers. At the universities, we've got 11 uh, professors to take part. I say teachers here, but they're professors, academics, like, like, like yourselves. Um, in the schools, we've got eight leaders to take part, and from the universities, we've got five. So in total, we had just under 97 participants, which was quite a lot for purely you know, interviews, tons and tons of, of data there. So obviously, we got that transcribed, we, we, we did some coding, um, we generated some themes, and then we decided to sort of categorize our findings according to the participant type. So what we found is parents were not happy with hybrid learning. Okay, for a number of reasons, right? So on one hand, um, actually the education sector in Dubai is quite expensive, it's quite costly. So parents were complaining about paying tuition fees when the children are at home. So why am I paying full fees when you know, they're at home with me rather than being on campus? Um, they were complaining about the need to actually teach a lot at home as well. They had to supplement a lot of what was happening. So they spent a lot of time teaching their kids. Um, but I think the number one complaint we heard was the lack of engagement during the online lessons. So when teachers were in the classroom with some students there and some students at home, they would just give you know, full attention to the students in the classroom. Um, I must say, I myself am victim to this. So um, I'm currently teaching hybrid this semester. Right? So I'm teaching a post-grad course uh, on qualitative research design, and I'm teaching a master's course on education technology. Um, and frankly speaking, I do it myself sometimes. The students are facing me, you know, I speak to them, and the ones online, sometimes I forget about them. So they were complaining about that. Um, so I, I highlighted a few interesting quotes. There was one parent who mentioned that uh, her son is actually watching YouTube during the lesson. So what happens often, the students are online, they have their camera off, the teacher can't see them, and so they're not engaged. Or some students are quite clever, they'll actually have the camera on so you can see them, but they've got the microphone muted, and so they're watching on an iPad or something, watching YouTube there, right? So the, you know, the parents pointed this out. Um, which is obviously a, a problem. So parents did not like this hybrid approach. Teachers also complained about this hybrid approach. Right? So many of the teachers were saying they felt overwhelmed by this experience. It was just too much, uh, too much to juggle all at once. Okay? Uh, uh, particularly in the K-12 sector, particularly in the high schools, because there's more behavior management issues there. So trying to you know, control some students playing around in the classroom, then the ones online, they're distracted, coming back, finding them, writing naughty things in the chat, telling them to behave, and then the ones back in the classroom. So it was a bit of a nightmare to manage the behavior with, with the high school, and you, you know what teenagers are like. Um, and they mentioned this point about doing double the work. So having to prepare a lesson which is going to be in class, but also online at the same time, because there's different ways that you're going to teach, different strategies you're going to use. So they complained about that as well. So teachers did not like this hybrid model uh, at all. Um, from my own experience, obviously it's a bit different at university level uh, compared to the, the schools, but also for me it's, it's a challenge. Um, sometimes when, when I'm able to, I get some of my PhD students to come and help out, so I'll have them manage the chat and things online right, sometimes, but you can't guarantee that every lesson and they're not getting paid for it. So, um, Now the students, on the other hand, love hybrid learning. So we saw that parents didn't like it and teachers didn't like it much, but the students love it. They love the flexibility of the hybrid model. Now I mentioned earlier that you have some students in class and some at home, but actually what we found from the interviews is most of the time the students weren't at home if they're at university level. They would often come to campus, but not go to class. So they're sitting in a coffee shop with their friends or they're hanging out in the library or something. So, so they're there on campus, but they don't feel like going to class that day, which we found quite surprising. Um, uh, yeah, so, so they really love this, uh, this hybrid model and the flexibility of you know, going to class when they wanted to. Um, although, in the K-12 sector, there was a slight problem, and I'm going to mention it late, later in the presentation. We also saw a positive response from the educational leaders. And interestingly, every one of them that we spoke to 
mentioned this, uh, this um, point of emergency remote teaching, ERT. So they said, well, we, we can't really judge the success of hybrid learning or blended learning during the pandemic because it's an emergency situation. I said, obviously, outside of a pandemic environment, we'd have time to plan carefully, we'd have time to pilot and, and practice things, whereas, you know, obviously we can't at the moment, but um, they love the data collection. Now, normally in schools here, teachers are observed once per academic year, right? So a uh, head of department will come, watch the teacher in the classroom once per year, do an observation, and that's it. So what the leaders were saying is that often teachers put their best effort into that one class. So if the observation is going to be in week nine, they've already built rapport with the students. They say, okay, behave, we have an observation happening uh, this week. You know, the teacher looks their best and everything gives their best effort, but that's a one shot out of the whole academic year. What was happening now is every lesson was recorded. It was, it was, man, it was mandatory. Even my lessons now when they're online, they're, they're all recorded. So you're now able to see from day one what the teacher's doing during the semester. How are they doing icebreaker activities? How, how are they building rapport with their students? How are they teaching on a daily basis? Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the leaders really um, valued the, uh, the data they were collecting, apparently. Now, from these interviews, there are a few things that came out, a few problems and, and solutions to these problems as well. Um, so I just wanted to share three tips for those of you uh, teaching in a hybrid uh, in, in context. The first uh, tip was to build a sense of community. I mentioned earlier there was a problem in the K-12 sector in the high schools between the students sometimes. There was this us v stem mentality. So the students who were in class were saying the students online are lucky they're at home today. And the students who were online at home were like, oh, I wish I could be in class today. Right? This is the, the high school kids. So they were complaining about that. There was also an issue of isolation. So some students really got lost. Those who were uh, online, um, uh, you know, some had special needs, but even the ones without special needs, maybe they're introverts, whatever the case was, there were some students who really fell behind. Uh, particularly if they found the course uh, difficult, they didn't receive the same support that they would do on campus. And so we found in some of the schools, they would talk about this team-based learning approach, which essentially was at the start of the semester, dividing the class into groups and keeping these groups consistent throughout the entire semester. So it's different to an ad hoc you know, group work activity you know, in week four. The, this group would remain together throughout the entire semester. There would be a team leader, um, and they had to support each other, whether they're on campus or whether they're online. So that sort of had some sort of sense of community, which was quite successful. The second tip is to avoid the technology entrapment. So on one hand, you, you, so you had people at two ends of the spectrum. There were some teachers who were really overwhelmed with all these you know, apps and this technology and they didn't like it very much, so they felt really stressed and under pressure. On the other hand, you had some tech-savvy teachers who went wild and any app they could find, they would have, they'd have six, seven apps in one lesson. It was just too much technology. So um, we saw that for those who prioritized pedagogy over technology, they were doing the, the, the best, it seemed. Um, this TPAC model got mentioned a couple of times, Mr. and Cole's TPAC model, where, where they talk about uh, um, you know, a teacher having content knowledge, pedagogical knowledge, and technological knowledge. And so pedagog pedagogical knowledge is basically understanding the best teaching methods for your content, and then using technology to support that. So the focus of their model was more about pedagogy and teaching strategies, and less about you know, which app is going to be good for today's lesson. And then the third tip was simply that practice makes perfect. So uh, for most of the teachers initially, they were facing lots of technical difficulties when they were teaching online. Um, the quality of their materials weren't so good. And, and so that was obviously uh, you know, quite, quite demotivating for them. Also for the parents complaining about what they saw in terms of the quality of the teaching. But over time, you know, semester by semester, teachers improved and, and got better, essentially. Okay. so. Uh, my, my final thoughts about this, uh, during the interviews, particularly with parents and teachers, we saw lots of negative feedback, except for two schools. And these two schools were using this learning management system, which is new to me, called Century Tech. So I'm, I'm still learning about this myself. Um, but apparently this system is built upon AI. So 
What the teachers were saying is, it made life easier for them because it created individualized learning paths for the students, those personalized. Now, in my institution, we use Blackboard Ultra. There is an option where I can you know, set some parameters and say, if student X performs so well on this assignment, then lead them down this way. But it's very clumsy and difficult to manage you know, as an individual teacher. Uh, but apparently, this system manages it all for them. So one of the teachers, she showed me uh, um, her, her, her system. Uh, I could see you know, the students in her class, what they were doing, and uh, it, was it was very impressive. Um, and it was interesting, so she taught mathematics, and she had two classes two class of the same grade, but the system would suggest to her, for this class, focus on this point, and this class, focus on that point. So it was aggregating the students' individual learning paths and suggesting what they should focus on. So this is something that I'm very interested in doing research on, um, uh, possibly in the summer or next academic year. Having said that, uh, those two schools were quite affluent. And at the same time, those teachers also had assistance. When I mentioned I had sometimes my PhD student helping me out, those two teachers had assistance as well. So it could be that just because they had assistance in the class, maybe that's why they did well. I'm not sure. Um, but if, coming back to the question, does hybrid learning work in Dubai's education sector, I think it depends who you're speaking to. So I think parents and teachers would say, no, thank you. But the students seem to love it. And I think the leaders are quite happy with it as well so far. So that's all I wanted to say for today. Thank you so much for your time. And Please feel free to answer any questions.